Okay, assalamu alaikum. Uh, welcome to lecture 26 of data mining. Today, uh, we will continue uh, with our discussion on uh, temporal data mining. We had earlier talked about the data, uh, temporal data in general, and we had talked about uh, time series data, sequence data, strings, and we had also talked about uh, some of the pre-processing that can be done on such kind of data. And uh, so today we will primarily talk about forecasting, uh, which is a key task in uh, time series analysis. And then I will briefly introduce motifs. And uh, also I think uh, I've kind of decided that whatever we cover today would basically be the essential uh, content for this course, we will not then have any lectures uh, next week. Because whatever is left that I'm thinking of doing, uh, which is outlier analysis, cluster analysis, it's somewhat similar to what we have already done before. Of course, there are some transformations from uh, the, some transformations that are required, but I think those are not too great of stuff that we need to spend too much time upon. So I think, and since we are into Ramzan as well, and COVID is also around and you have your assignments and you have your uh, projects, I've decided that next week uh, we won't have any more lectures. So whatever we do today would be it for this course. And this would then be covered or tested in your final exam. So, so that is basically the agenda for today. <clears throat> Any questions? So I have uh, uploaded a chapter from a textbook that is part of your reading for this part of the course. Uh, this chapter is from the book by Agarwal. So please go over that book. Uh, it is a comprehensive book uh, and also has a lot of references that you can uh, further use to go into deeper into some of the techniques that are mentioned. So any questions? So, so we wanted to talk about forecasting. Forecasting as the name suggests uh, is trying to build a model that can predict the future of a time series. And a time series, as we had mentioned previously, is some time values, T1 to Tn. And for each of those time values, we have some uh, in general, scalar values, it could be vectors as well, but we are considering scalar so far, x1 to xn. So this would then be a univariate time series. Uh, each of those x is a scalar value, a number, uh, and each of those is recorded at a specified time corresponding to the t, that is uh, the second series. So t, of course, is the uh, contextual attribute X is of course the behavioral attribute. Uh, and forecasting, as I said, means that uh, given preceding values, we need to predict the next value. And there are various applications of that. Uh, so for example, you have weather forecasting. So weather forecasting, so stock price, for example, forecasting. Uh, in fact, you can also talk about things like inflation, any economic indicators, inflation, for example, GDP, or any other KPI, key performance indicator of any particular organization can be forecasted because all of these uh, uh, values vary with time and, and they're also of importance to see what would happen to these values in the future. So building forecasting models for them is always important. Okay. Uh, so to understand uh, forecasting, you need to 
uh, understand the idea of stationarity. We talked about that last time. I won't go into that again. Uh, from a purely statistical perspective, uh, it is good to have a time series that is stationary, but that is kind of an elusive goal in practice. Most real world time series are not uh, stationary and the procedures to make them stationary are also non-trivial, they're not easy. So, but a couple of things in this regard I would like to mention. Uh, one is a time series is, uh, has, contextual attributes that relate those two points. So for example, if you have a value at T, so you have value, for example, X2, and you have a value at X4. So these two values would be related or closer because they are close with respect to the context. One is recorded at T2, the other is recorded at T4. And assuming that these indices are indicative of the order, so they are close together, as opposed to, for example, let's say X, let's say 100. So, and this is kind of a law of nature that two observations that are uh, contextually close would be similar. And of course, which also implies that they would be correlated if you try to find the correlation between them. But as you go further away, as the contextual window increases, the correlation or the similarity would decrease. So autocorrelation is a concept that you need to understand and also visualize, visualize for time series data. So, so for example, let's say, uh, so, so let's say I call this temperature data, but uh, I'll give numbers that are kind of more. Uh, so let's say we have temperature 10, 12, this is second number, then we have 12 again, third, 12 again, fourth, 10th, fifth, uh, then we have uh, 10, sixth, 10, seventh, all right, seven days. And then we have, it continues. Let's say we have 13, we have 13, this is two, we have 10, three, uh, we have uh, whatever, uh, 10, four, 12, five, 11, six, and 12, again, seven, and then so on. So what I'm trying to explain is, uh, of course, correlation would be high for two values that are close together. But sometimes time series may have some other patterns that might repeat, uh, that might repeat uh, with that period. So let's say, just a hypothetical example, let's say temperature patterns repeat every seven days. So then autocorrelation with the first value, let's say X1, X1 would be high with X8. Similarly, X2 and X9, X3, and X10 and so on. So in other words, if you created a two column uh, data set, the first column is X1, X2, X3, X4. The second column is X8, 9, 10, 11 and compute the Pearson correlation coefficient, that coefficient would be high in a absolute sense. It might be high in the negative or it might be high in the positive. So this means that these two uh, values are correlated, are strongly correlated, but now there's a gap between them. So this gap is explained by the fact that there is some periodicity or seasonality in the data. But how do you decide how far that is? Of course, you have to visualize or you need to have some domain knowledge. So that's why this, as I said, this is kind of part of also data exploration. Of course, if you plot X1 and X2, X2, X3 and X3, X4. If you have these two columns of values and compute the correlation between them, that correlation would be high. This is from the law of nature. You can say two close values in the context would be correlated. The previous one was based on some specific behavior of the data generating process. There is some seasonality. 
ठीक है so auto why we call it auto correlation of course is correlation between values of the same attribute okay but of course when we want to compute correlation we have to put values in one column values in other column and then compute the pearson correlation coefficient and since we are if we are trying to find the correlation between the current value and the preceding value then these the current these columns that i mentioned x1 x2 x3 first column second one the x2 x3 x4 and so on and if there is some seasonality then of course the gap or the lag would be some seasonal lag some fixed time difference so so values that are correlated would help you predict the next value so that is the next take away from here so that's why we are doing this analysis all right so values with strong correlation might be positive might be negative but they will help you better predict the next value so that's one thing the other thing that i want to talk about was the idea of mean so by the way correlation and mean are statistics so mean so mean over some time would be uh or you can say a trend line over time if that trend line is generally increasing it means that the value would increase with time and the mean if you compute it over windows would increase so the mean itself uh, is also a key indicator of how predictable a particular value is if you take windows so let's say us wahi wala window ki main baat karta hu first 7 days ka mean liya the next 7 days ka liya if in general फर्स्ट सेवन डे का मीन जो था इट डजेंट चेंज ओवर मल्टीपल विंडोज से मल्टीपल टाइम सीरीज एंड मल्टीपल कैप्चर्स ऑफ द डेटा मीन रिमेन द सेम सो दैट इज ओके बट फॉर अनदर टाइम पीरियड द मीन माइट बी डिफरेंट सो लेट से टाइम पीरियड हो गया लेट से द फर्स्ट वीक ऑफ फेब्रवरी इफ यू कंप्यूट द सेल्स फॉर द फर्स्ट वीक ऑफ फेब्रवरी फॉर ऑल द ईयर्स दैट यू हैव and it remains the same then we say that during the first week of february the sales remains the same but let's say if you have another seven day period let's say this seven day period is let's say the last week of ramzan all right so obviously the sales during the last period of ramzan would be very high so this mean of course would be same for other last week of ramzans but it will be different from the first week of february so knowing such patterns would also help you better predict the future so these are some two important things uh, they might be others as well but these are two important things that you need to look into and observe whenever you have a time series forecasting problem uh, so far both of these two things that we have looked into are kind of linear sometimes the behavior tends to be non linear and you might want to do some transformation to see whether there is some well defined non linearity so so maybe for example you can let's say you have the original series x1 to xn this is your original series and then you just to make sure if there is some non linearity that can be tracked by some function you take the log let's say x1 and similarly log xn so you plot the original series x and you plot the log of the series so if by taking the log some of the non linearities become more predictable then maybe you should do your analysis in the log space your prediction analysis in the log space so for example let's say so let's say aapka koi uh time series let's say you have a time series uh let's see let's say some curvature aapke paas aa raha hai some some curvature but if you take the log maybe this curvature might become straight and analyzing a straight line 
and building a prediction model for a straight line is much easier. Okay. So you can apply such transformations to see uh, if your time series becomes much more predictable or not. And of course, you can do this as part of your visualization also. So another aspect which I think I mentioned last time was differencing. Find a difference between two uh, values. It might be adjacent or it might be some seasonal difference away and see if that difference remains the same, then that is also a pattern that you like to track and use for prediction. So most of this is uh, kind of helping you understand the time series and maybe help you better design a forecasting model. But now let's look at a traditional forecasting model. Uh, which is based on regression. And uh, we will discuss this and then uh, we will talk about maybe some uh, neural network approaches as well, very briefly. So in the literature, uh, we have uh, regression can be used for prediction. And for time series regression, we have auto regression, AR. And these models are also sometimes called AR models. And there are some extensions, we will briefly discuss all of them. We have ARMA model, which is autoregressive moving average model. And then we have ARIMA model, which is autoregressive integrated moving average model. And then there are of course, uh, ARMA models or ARIMA models that are for uh, multi-valued uh, time series multivariate time series. So far, we are going to only talk about univariate time series. So these are the traditional, uh, and they're still quite popular in practice. Uh, I wouldn't say okay, they are not used, they are used. And that's why we are studying it here. Uh, these are the popular models for time series forecasting. So let's uh, look at these. So essentially what regression is, is trying to predict a value based on some other values, weighted combination of other values. In autoregressive, we are trying to predict the next value based on the previous weighted combination of the previous values. Okay, so, so essentially let's say if you want to predict X at some time period T, so I'm not writing it as a sub, subscript, you understand XT. So you can write this as, uh, for example, some constant C plus uh, A1. This is another a parameter uh, into X, uh, X T minus one plus another parameter A2 into X T minus two. Plus of course, there will be some error E. So this is uh, the general idea of a AR model, autoregressive model. We consider some preceding time window whose weighted linear weighted combination with some bias C or some constant mean deviation would help you predict the next value. So in other words, this is our model for prediction. And of course, as you can see, it's a linear model uh, and it uses the preceding two uh, values of the time series. So these preceding two, uh, so number of preceding values is often in the literature statistics as well in the book is called P. And this is basically the window of values that are used to predict the next. However, if you remember my discussion on autocorrelation, these may not be the two contiguous preceding values. They might be other values. We, in general, we want to choose, choose those values that are highly correlated with the next value. Of course, closer values would be correlated by, by in default, but there might be other values as well based on seasonality or periodicity. 
and how do you decide which those values are mostly from observation and domain expertise so so we can generalize this so xt is equal to some constant c plus some error e plus you have a summation over i is equal to 1 to p of a i into x t minus p so this model is then called the auto regressive model of order p because we are considering p preceding values sometimes it's also called arp model a r p model so let's say uh, your time series uh, was kind of somewhat nonlinear and you had found some function to make it somewhat linear, then these x axes that are written may be those transform values. You don't need to use uh, the, uh, the original values. Let's say you've done the log transformation, then these axes that are written are the log values. Because you have now made an observation that by making that transformation, you are a series become more or less more predictable or becomes somewhat linear. Okay, so you can do such transformations before you apply this AR model. So in this case, C and all the AIs are parameters. E is the error term to make sure that right hand side and left hand side would become equal. But of course, after learning, uh, you would not get exact values. There will be some error and that, that, uh, uh, that is captured in E. And that E would of course be, ideally should be random, but it could have other patterns as well. So generally when we are learning, we don't estimate E. So E is then kind of left out. And what we have is then XT prime, the estimate. Okay, C plus uh, sum over I is equal to one to P of A I into X uh, T minus I. So this is then the model that you actually learn and when I say learn, we estimate the parameters A, I, and C from data. And what is the data? The data that we have, the time series that we have after whatever transformation that you have done. Okay. So from that, so obviously this is learning. So you'll keep some of that data for training to fix this model and use some the remaining data for testing. Okay, so once you have learned this model and you have obtained the parameter C and A, you can also use those parameters to study the time series as well. So the C of course is a constant term, uh, which means that what is the constant trend throughout the time series that will be reflected by C, kind of the, the mean of the entire series, that is C. So C is basically, the mean of the, and then of course, AI, the value AI, the absolute value AI, it might be positive or negative, would indicate the importance of the preceding value X, T minus I for the prediction. So if AI for any I is close to zero, it means that that particular uh, point in time doesn't contribute to the prediction and it might be dropped. So in other words, this is kind of indicating those values that have high correlation with the predicted value. 
So the value of A also indicates that. Okay. Okay, now let's uh, move on to the AR ARMA model, ARMA model. So, so far we have predicted the next value uh, based on the preceding value, linear combination of the preceding values. But we also said that there might be an error E at each time step. So sometimes, uh, by the way, this is a linear prediction. So that linear prediction may not be able to capture the trend. So they might always remain some error at each prediction some error ET. So now the error is of course at each time time. So you will have ET there, okay? So, and the next prediction may be based on some linear combination of these errors as well. So in other words, the errors with their linear combination, it's kind of, you can say original value was X, you predicted here X, the next one you predicted this one. So the difference of course is the error and you take the mean of that and mean because it's weighted. Whenever you weigh something in a linear fashion, you can also think of it as a mean. And then you use that to predict, better predict the next value. So if you remember, we talked about moving average previously as well, you had a parameter alpha there. The, there, of course, there was just one parameter alpha and the other was one minus alpha, of course. Uh, here, of course, you have a set of parameters and we are taking combinations of that to help us predict the next value. So that's why this is called moving average. So such models, of course, are called ARMA models and they have both AR and MA as part of it. So. If I want to write it, it would be like X prime T, this is a predicted value, would then be some constant C, plus we have now two summation, two sum I is equal to one to P, this is our original ARMA model, AI into X T minus I, plus then we have the M moving average linear combination model. So we have another summation, of I is equal to one to let's say Q. And then we have BI, this is another set of parameters into errors at T minus I. So of course, error would only be available after you have made the prediction. So you can see the uh, kind of uh, cyclicity in this analysis, cycle in this analysis. So obviously then estimating this model is much more uh, sophisticated. Uh, to find the parameters in the AR model, you just have to solve a least square optimization problem. While in this case, in the ARMA model, since there is uh, a cycle in the model, uh, what is predicted is also used for the prediction. So you have to use a, a nonlinear type of estimation technique. Of course, it's not that difficult as well, but we won't go into the detail to estimate this model, okay? So of course now the parameters that we have is C, AIs, and of course the BIs. BIs corresponding to the error components, AI corresponding to the preceding values. So this model is then of course called the ARMA, and sometimes we also include the P and Q there. So P preceding values and Q preceding errors. So this is called the ARMA PQ model. These, this is also estimated from the data, some training data, but it's not a straightforward, uh, it is straightforward, but I'm saying it's somewhat more involved than the least square optimization uh, that you do for the AR model only. This is the ARMA model. By the way, these errors that we are using the prediction E, we also sometimes call them shocks. 
because these are the differences between the predicted and actual value. So this is a shock. So how do the shocks help us predict the next value? If we made a bigger shock, then of course we need to include that in the next prediction. And let's say in the best scenario, all of those E's would be very close to zero. Then of course the second part, the MA part would not contribute to the model. Okay. So let's say your time series, let's say it was linear, almost linear. And your AR model would model that very well. So the second part is then not required or would not play any role. Let's say you have to add it, then BI's values will be a little bit. Zero, zero ke kareeb it means that effectively they are not participating in the prediction. Okay. So this is the AR uh, ARMA model, and then we have the ARIMA model, which uh, of course I wouldn't go write the equation for that. Again, this is also P and Q. The only difference here is that we use, I is for integrated. So we use differencing. Differencing instead of original values. So we talked about differencing previously as well. So what is differencing? So the value at xt is basically xt uh, minus xt minus one. For example, if you are differencing of one value. So in other words, so isko method prime dal later because this is a new value. And then of course you model you build a regression model using X primes only now. Just like we have said, log first, and after log, ke baad, log ke aap model log. Here we are saying that take the differencing and then build a model with differencing. But the ARIMA model has this differencing included in the model itself. Previously, you don't need to do it. Okay? So, so this is the only difference between Arima and Arma. Okay, so any questions so far? So their extension to the there are extensions to the ARMA model for multivariate time series as well. So, so far we have considered univariate time series. So X was a scalar, but let's say if X is a vector, so X can be a vector as well. At any point in time, it might be multiple values, okay? So if X is a vector, then there are some extensions to handle that as well. Uh, we won't go into details here, but what I will mention here is that, so obviously now we have the time series, so X1, X2, and so on. And each of those X's are vectors, which means that each of those X's would have multiple individual values. So, so far we have talked about correlation between X1 and X2, but now X1 and X2 are multiple values. So we, of course, will find correlation between X1 and X2 and Xn, but we'll also analyze the correlation between elements of those uh, vectors. So that is called cross correlation rather than auto correlation. Auto correlation is across time, cross correlation is within a vector. So these models basically then consider both auto and cross correlation. And of course, these are also linear models in general, unless you have done some nonlinear transformation a priori, like taking the log. Uh, and uh, uh, I think I won't go into the math of that uh, notation complex. Uh, most of these are found in almost all 
uh, machine learning, statistics, toolkits and toolboxes and APIs, you can find all of them implemented in them. Okay, any question? Okay, a brief, uh, I would say, uh, you can say, uh, indication of what is happening in industry. Arma, Arima, and these are still popular in practice, but now also uh, neural networks have become popular in the industry as well for time series prediction. So Arma, Arima, as I said, they are still popular. I would say for most problems that come in the industry, 50% of the times, yeah, even more, first we do apply these models and then we move to the neural network model if we are not satisfied with them. So neural network models there, I'll just mention some names here and we have covered some of these in more detail in the NLP course. Uh, so we can, for time series analysis, typically we can use recurrent neural networks. And of course, there are many flavors of recurrent neural networks. And one of the positive things about uh, neural networks is that they can be much uh, adapt, adapt, or they are more effective in modeling nonlinear behaviors because of the nonlinearities that are present in the neural network. And also because they have multiple layers of adaptation. So like in the ARMA model, you just have one set of parameters, AI or AI and BI, and of course C. In this traditional RNN, for example, with multiple layers, you will have tons, many more parameters, which basically means that you have more power in modeling. And of course that modeling can also be nonlinear. So in general, for applying neural networks, although this is not always true, but in general for applying neural network, you don't need to do uh, those processing that we studied earlier, like differencing, you're taking the log or looking at the mean or looking at the autocorrelation. That is generally not helpful. Although you can do it for your own understanding, but for a neural network, you can feed it the raw data and it will be able to model it reasonably well. You don't have to do any additional pre-processing. So in other words, feature engineering is limited or not required. Okay. So that is one of the big pluses. And of course it can model, uh, models are more complex and more expressive. Uh, why am I having spelling mistakes? Expressive. And of course they can be nonlinear in general. So in a recurrent neural network, one time point is fed once at, it, at each interval until you have fed all the values. Or let's say if you're doing the uh, forecasting, then once you have fed a value, you get the prediction, then you feed in the next value, you get the prediction, feed in the next value, you get the prediction. But as you feed in the value, the preceding values are also retained in the network. So that is kind of the memory in the network. And that memory can be of theoretically infinite length. You don't have a fixed window like in ARMA. You, that length can be larger from a theoretical perspective. Of course, practically it might only use the first few values. The uh, values that are much further back may not be used. So there are uh, some extensions to uh, RNN, simple RNN. So we have what is known as a GRU, gated recurrent unit. We have what is uh, the long short term memory network. Uh, these provide greater control over the memory and they would typically do better uh, for more complex time series. So I have also kind of noticed that 
usually whenever you want to apply a neural network, we don't start with the RNN, standard RNN. We usually start with the GRU LSTM because they are more flexible, more uh, adaptable. So that is uh, more popular in the industry as well as in practice. So of course, we don't have the scope to discuss these models in this class. And of course, uh, more modern techniques like transformers can also be used, but they are less popular so far for time series analysis. They are more popular for NLP applications. So NLP, ke liye, uh, sorry, time series, ke liye, LSTM and uh, GRU are the more common approaches. Okay, any question? All right, so let me then briefly introduce the idea of motifs and then we will stop. So, motifs. So this is, I think, the next section in the textbook. So what exactly is a motif? So motif is basically a recurring pattern. Or shape in a in temporal data and basically it can be both time series or sequence data. So, and the idea in motif detection is we want to find, uh, so the problems can be posed in different ways. So you can find, for example, the K motifs in a time series, which means that the K most frequent motifs in a single time series. So let's say you have a time series, let's say temperature recordings for Lahore or at a specific point in Lahore, let's say uh, LUMS over an entire decade. So a lot of data, but of course, just one univariate time series. So there might be some patterns that might repeat over those 10 years. So the K motifs would be the K most frequent patterns that have been observed in those 10 years. So that is what a motif is, a pattern. And pattern, of course, is a pattern over time. Okay. So, so usually our problems would be formulated in this way. Either you find the K motifs, which are the K most frequent shapes that occur in a time series, or sometimes you might give a kernel uh, given a shape uh, or you can say kernel find the of that in the time series. So let's say you are interested in some specific patterns. Let's say some stock price crash, something throws up a dump in each So this is a specific pattern. So you give that as an input and then tell the algorithm, does this pattern occurs in a time series or not? And how many times does it occur? Okay. So this could also be an application of motifs. Okay. So, so, so far we have looked at uh, motifs within one time series, but let's say if you have multiple time series, let's say temperature recording may pass 10 saal ke liye lumps ki bhi hai, DHA phase five ki hai, ITU university may hai, packages ki hai, whatever, multiple places. So you have multiple time series. Now the question is, what are the frequent shapes that occur in all of those? What are the shapes that occur in all of those patterns? Okay, so across time series. So in other words, find frequent patterns in multiple 
time series. And this is very similar to what we have already studied for sequential Okay. Of course, when we discuss sequential pattern mining, we said that those values were discrete. So if you had continuous values and you had the same task, then this would be very similar to that. Okay. So multiple have time series, hai, let's say uh, A1, pala, okay. uh, A1 hai, let's say A2, hai, A3, hai, A4, hai. Now you want to find a pattern that is frequent across all of those four time series. Okay, so A1 is, let's say, LAMS, A2 is packages, A3 is uh, Pata Chalk, A4 is ITU, for example. And we want to find which pattern occurs in all of them, for example. Frequent. So frequency could be defined in terms of ratios of the number of series that you have. So this is another application of motifs. So we call this motifs in the context of uh, time series and temporal data. While when we were discussing strings previously, we called that sequential pattern mining. So uh, very briefly about the two, the first case was we are trying to find K motifs, for example, in one time series, so usually we have some distance-based approach. And of course, whenever you have a distance-based approach, you need to have a distance function or similarity function or proximity function defined. And based on that, you will have to find, uh, so let me just say, let's say you have a kernel, which shape you have to give it. And then of course you have the time series A. So what you do is you move this kernel over this A and compute uh, whatever distance function that you are, that is appropriate for your application, let's say Euclidean distance. If the Euclidean distance between the kernel and A at any window over which this kernel fits is less than some threshold, then you say that this is one motif. Okay. But it's make issue, of course, what I overlaps. Ka. So, usko aapne judiciously handle karna. so let's say my kernel is of length three. Kernel, mein, let's say four, tha, two, tha, or three, tha. Ye mera pattern hai. let's say. Theek hai? Or mere paas original time series, hai, of course, that is longer. Let's say mere paas two, hai, five, hai, six, hai, four, hai, three, hai, eight, hai, nine. Hai. And you move this kernel over this window and compute the equivalent distance. So, pale in tino ke upar compute hoga including distance. Let's say ye including distance mera threshold se kam a jata hai. Iska matlab ye phir mera ek motif ban gaya. But aapne jab window ek aage ki, to sirf only one step forward pe, let's say phir distance aapka including distance minimum se kam aage. So, that sometimes is not considered a motif because there's an overlap. Okay. So you have to decide upfront ke kitna overlap aap tolerate karenge, otherwise usko aap discard kar denge. So usually 50% overlap se uh, zyada overlap ho to usko aap separate motif consider nahi karte. 50% se kam ho to then we uh, consider it as motif. Okay. Of course, it's may kernel ki koi scaling or translation humne nahi ki bhi. So if you want to do that, then of course, wo humne jo piche technique padhi thi, DTW aapko use karna padega, dynamic time warping. So this would be the case when you want to find shape wohi rahe, but usko aap bada chota bhi kar sake and then try to fit them. Dynamic time warping aapko phir use karna padega, not the simple Euclidean distance. Okay. And then, of course, there are other techniques that can give you the K top most frequent motifs in a given time series. discuss uh, book algorithm. But I think I want to kind of wrap up now <laughs> some of these things. Uh, 
uh, are easy, but you just have to read them once. And the idea here is that I'm just informing you so that if you want to uh, come across such problems, you know what to do. So you can always look up uh, the appropriate techniques and look up the libraries that impl implement those techniques. Okay, then the second part was, uh, this was finding motifs in one series. So now if you have a database or time series and you want to find frequent patterns, uh, frequent motifs, so this approach we use hoti jo humne pehle study ki thi in frequent pattern mining. But then of course you have to discretize the, the time series, which becomes, which means that you have transformed them into sequences. So once you have those sequences, then you can apply any sequential pattern mining technique. So this may, for example, you have to GSP, for example, generalized sequential pattern. So that can be uh, used to find frequent patterns in multiple time series. So uh, that is essentially it. Uh, in addition to this, for temporal data mining, you can also do clustering in different ways. Uh, we have already studied clustering techniques, but they have to be applied in different ways for time series. And each way would be defined by the application, by the appropriate problem setting. Then of course, outlier analysis, and then finally classification. Because of these, I'm not going to discuss and kind of uh, stopping here. Uh, so any questions? Okay, so so that brings us to the brings us to the conclusion of content covered in this course. So we had covered twenty six lectures, uh, and we have covered a fair amount of topics in data mining. Uh, so we have, if you look at the standard data mining textbooks like the Introduction to Data Mining or Data Mining Concepts and Techniques, we have con covered most of the chapters. The only chapter that we did not cover in some detail is the classification chapter, but we did do classification. We covered the uh, decision trees and random forest. Uh, the time series uh, analysis is not part of those standard textbooks. Time series is part of other books like the data mining book by Agarwal. Of course, that book is much bigger. It has con uh, coverage of other topics as well spatial temporal data mining, uh, graph data mining, sequence, uh, stream data mining, and so on. So, so I think that's uh, it. I hope you enjoyed uh, taking data mining uh, with us here. Uh, we have covered content, but of course their applicability is strongly dependent on uh, each problem that you have. Uh, you have to adapt your uh, your solution to each problem. And that is one of the things that you should have gained out of this course. But data mining is not a, uh, uh, you can say, a automatic process. You need to have a person sitting there looking at the results, looking at the models, and then making the final decision. It's not purely automatic. As a data miner, which I hope many of you would become later on, uh, you would be doing this task of analyzing the data, analyzing the models and making a final decision. 
So I think that's uh, all from my side. If there is no question, then we will probably end.